Hi there, Marcus Peter of Unveiling the Covenant. You've been joining us on Ave Maria Radio's Advent Mission. This week, we're talking about the fourth week of Advent. This week, we light the fourth candle. We focus on the theme of love. And the fourth candle's name is the angel's candle, the candle of the angels. And we'll talk about why that is. Come January, we will continue with our regularly scheduled programming for Unveiling the Covenant. Consider this a retreat, a pause, an opportunity to immerse ourselves in the mysteries and the joys that the Christmas season will bring us. Let's take a look at the fourth Sunday of Advent. This week, our priests will light the fourth and final candle on our Advent wreaths. Now, a recent tradition would have it that we have a white candle in the center called the Christ candle, and that candle will be lit on Christmas Day. But typically, you've got the four-candle model and the fourth purple candle following last week's rose candle will be lit, and that candle is called the angel's candle. So, Let's talk about what that means. This week, we've got the theme of love. But angels appear in the Christmas story before Jesus is even conceived. It's an angel that announces, first of all, the conception and birth of John the Baptist to his father, Zechariah. An angel also goes on to, the angel Gabriel specifically, goes on to talk to Mary, announcing to her the birth of the coming Messiah and that she is to be his mother. This feast is known as the Annunciation, and it's a Christological feast as much as it is a Mariological feast. The Gospel of Luke describes how the angel Gabriel does this in Luke chapter 1, and we will talk about that Gospel in a little bit. Just to recap each of the candles that are lit during the Advent season, candle 1 is purple, and it's known as the prophet's candle. And it has to do with looking back unto every single prophet that announced the coming of the Messiah, the Messiah who was to come and save not only Israel, but the entire world. And the, the theme of that week is hope, because that's all Israel had, hope for the future, hope for the covenant promise that God had in store for them. Candle 2 is also purple, it's violet, and it was known as the Bethlehem candle because all of those prophecies eventually come to a culmination with the person of David and the Davidic son, the son of David, the Davidic heir who will sit upon the eternal Davidic throne. And because Bethlehem is the city of David, the son of God who became man was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, because he is truly the heir to the Davidic throne. And so Week two has the theme of peace because David's reign brought about, it ushered in an era of peace on the borders of Israel. It ushered in the kingdom of Israel, which lasted as a unified kingdom for 80 years, 40 with David and 40 with Solomon. Candle three is the rose-colored candle. And the theme for that week was joy. Because now that we have the peace ushered in by the Messiah, we can rejoice in the fact that we are awaiting his presence. We are awaiting our experience of his manifestation to us. And finally, candle four goes back to the theme of violet. And it's the angel's candle. The theme of this week is love. And we get to focus deeply on God's love and what that means for us as a people called to love. And I want to put this out there. We are called to love, but we're not called to be emotionally affectionate. And there's a stark difference. We're going to talk about that. As I mentioned earlier, angels appear in the Christmas narrative pretty early on. After giving Zechariah the message, the angel after some time appears to Mary and announces the birth of the Messiah. The night Jesus was born, angels appeared to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem, announcing the Messiah's birth, and also told them where to find him. Several years later, an angel appears to Joseph in a dream, telling Joseph to take Mary and the child out of Nazareth into Egypt. And then an angel will appear to him again to bring him back to Nazareth. So angels have been directly playing a hand in the life of the Messiah. Because rightly speaking, the Catechism tells us that the angels are truly Christ's in a very unique way. And so they respond to the orders of Christ. They are his servants primarily, more than anything. 
Catechism chapter, paragraph number 328 tells us this. The existence of the spiritual non-corporeal beings that sacred scripture usually calls angels is a truth of faith. In other words, it's de fide. It is a matter of faith. We have an obligation to believe that angels exist. Surprisingly, and almost in a rather silly manner, the United States no longer tops the world in a lot of things. We no longer top the world in a high-ranking GDP. We no longer top the world in in uh, production and education. We top the world in two things. Number one, defense spending. And number two, the highest number of people who believe in angels. Now, take that statistic for what it's worth. But why is this crucial? Because there seems to be an inherent understanding within the human person that there are spiritual beings that are out there. So let's talk about what angels are. St. Augustine of Hippo actually tells us that angel is not their name. Angelos, angel in Greek, is 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 really the title of their office. It's not their nature. Rightly speaking, they're called spirits. But with their whole beings, angels are servants and messengers of God. And therefore, they become, in a real sense, servants of the covenant children of God. They always behold the face of the Father who is in heaven. They are the mighty ones who do His word, hearkening to the voice of His word. So, they, because they're purely spiritual creatures, they have true intelligence and they have a will. They are personal, immortal creatures. They're not arbitrary lights. They're real persons. They are truly angelic persons. They have been present since before material creation, and they've been present from material creation throughout salvation history. The good angels working always on the behalf of God to work out the will of God in the life of the covenant faithful, and they serve and accomplish the divine plan. They Closed uh, The angels are the ones who closed off earthly paradise to fallen Adam and Eve. They protect Lot. They saved Hagar and her child. They stayed Abraham's hand from sacrificing Isaac. They communicate the law of God by means of their ministry. They lead the people of God as we see in the Exodus. They announce births of multiple people. They announce callings to multiple people. I mean, you take a look at, for example, especially the calling of Isaiah in chapter 6, verse 1 of the book of Isaiah. And you see that angels, seraphim, are the ones who appear to Isaiah and anointing him with a special call, touching his lips with coal. They assist the prophets. And finally, the angel Gabriel announces the birth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. So from the incarnation to the ascension, angelic beings have been intimately present, woven into the mystery of the paschal life of Jesus Christ, the Word incarnate. When God brings his Son into the world, God's angels worship him. They are at his beck and call at any given moment. They sing in heaven glory to God in the highest. And so when the Son of God was on earth, he never left in a real sense his heavenly beatitude. And so they eternally were worshipping Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Trinitarian intimacy. And so angels in this sense evangelize. They, they bring the good news of Christ's incarnation and resurrection. Because at his resurrection, who was sitting outside of the tomb? Well, they were angelic beings. To announce to the people who arrived at that point, nope, the one you are looking for has risen. He has risen from the dead. Do not look for him among the dead. And they will be present when Jesus comes again, which, as I would like to remind you, is the purpose of the Advent season. So yes, turn to angelic beings. We don't talk to our guardian angels enough. I also want to say a word in caution here. No matter how many people have told you you ought to name your guardian angel, do not. Please do not. The, the church is very clear about a lot of things, and basic metaphysics also tells us this. Angelic beings speak and conduct themselves in a manner that's far more elevated than human limited fallen material capacity can handle. Therefore, the names that the angelic beings have are unique and unrepeatable. What does that mean? When we think about Mikael, who is like God. Michael, the angel, the archangel Michael, is the fullness of Michaelness. That there is no other Michael that is like the angel Michael. 
Gabriel, the Gabriel, this this man of God, this this mouthpiece of God. There's no other archangel that is like Gabriel. They have true angelic names that are very unique to them. So very often people say, well, pray and then you will receive a word and that word is your angel's name. Do not do it. There's there's roots in new age practices for, for stuff like that. You don't have to do that. Call your guardian angel, guardian angel. And speak to your guardian angel. In fact, develop a habit of seeking the intercession of your guardian angel. And know this, you can send your guardian angel out on assignments. They really are there to be at our service. So there's this joke here that at the general judgment, you and I are to judge the angels. But the funny thing is, what on earth could we judge the good angels for? They are completely in the will of God. Well, you know, we will judge them for not coming to our aid when we need them. But the thing is, they will come to our aid every time we call them. In fact, very frequently, they are actually at our aid even if we don't call them. But there's a a real reality of instrumental causality here. God wants us to summon the angels, to to, to beckon them to our aid. And so on the general judgment, when we when we judge them for not coming to our aid, we're really judging ourselves for not having called upon them to begin with. It's a real object of divine human. I can only imagine the angels laughing and us having a good laugh at that moment as well. Call upon them. They are there for us. Your guardian angel has been assigned to you uniquely since the beginning of time. That is your guardian angel. And he wants to be at your service because his primary goal, his only goal, is to get you to heaven. Now, whether or not a soul truly winds up in heaven, the guardian angel has laboriously been working for the sake of leading that soul to heaven. And so, at the end of that person's life, whether heaven or hell, the guardian angel has perfectly done their work. So seek their intercession. Call upon them to help you. And watch as they do so. Summa Theologiae, this is in the Prima Pass, question 62, article 4, if you're wondering. It, it talks about how the angels had a very particular grace that was given to them. When the angels were created, they were created in a state of grace. They were able to experience God, but not behold him face to face. Two-thirds of the angels chose God. And so these, grace, uh, these angels received in grace merited beatitude. This is how Aquinas writes it. The angels had grace ere they were admitted to beatitude, before they were admitted to beatitude, and that by such grace, angels merited beatitude. So God poured himself into the angels by means of created grace. He poured his own life into the angels, and they, two-thirds of them, chose God, and they entered into eternal happiness. One-third chose rebellion against God. God never forced them. He granted them the same grace. He granted them the outpouring of his own life, and they chose rebellion against God. This is crucial to remember for a lot of reasons. Sometimes you will hear people pre- uh, preach things to the effect of, we ought to pray for the demons. No, you, those prayers really go nowhere. I, I need to be very honest. The angelic beings that have made their decisions, they've made final decisions. Demons are not going to repent. Good angels are not going to become demons. They, the, the good angels are eternally locked in beatitude. They have eternal happiness beyond compare. And there is no realm within which sin will ever exist. And the angels that chose rebellion against God fully understood what they chose. And because of that, they will never repent. Satan is not going to repent. I remember sitting in a talk where this person, a Catholic, was telling, do you pray for the conversion of Satan? You should. Every day you should. Satan's not going to convert himself. Simple angelic metaphysics tells us that that the repentance of the angels is a closed matter. Now, why do I say this? Because the good angels are there for us. Two-thirds of the angels are there warring for us, fighting for us, aiding us, celebrating with us, having joy with us, and journeying with us on this journey unto salvation. So they share in the beauty and the urgency of the gospel message. They see the importance of not only Jesus' incarnation, but also the salvation that Jesus works in our life. They want us to go to heaven. The, the, the good angels, the heavenly angels, are constantly striving for our sainthood. 
especially when we don't see them, you and I can trust that they are there to ensure that you and I get into eternal happiness. So call upon them constantly. Call upon Mary, who is truly the queen of angels, for where she goes and where her intercession goes, throngs of angels follow. Now, that's why we called that fourth candle the angel's candle, because angels played and continue to play a significant part in salvation history. As they continue to play out that part, they are working out salvation history in us because they're true, faithful messengers of God the Father. So far from being distant, they are direct. Far from being just immaterial and therefore non-existent, they are immaterial and therefore more alive than you and I are because they are united to the divine essence of the loving Father who himself has poured his life and love into them and they behold his face day and night and they want us to behold his face day and night. That's the love of the angels coming directly from the love of God the Father being poured directly into our own hearts as covenant children. Only those who are inducted into God's covenant receive of this kind of fatherly existence of God, receive of this love of God. So let's talk about why the church tells us then that this week is the week of love. Catechism 1766 tells us, and, and I need all of us to really pay attention to this, love to love is to will the good of the other. Now, you've watched episodes of Unveiling the Covenants before, and you've heard me mention this. What this means is, yes, there is an affective reality in love, but love is an act of the will. We choose to love. Affections follow suit from the choice we make to love. The thing we love, the thing we choose to will the good of will inform the kind of person we are. We become like the thing we love. That This is why, and I argue this in a rather silly manner, this is why the longer people are married, the more they wind up looking like each other. And I don't mean that in, in any form of an insult. It is because the longer they love each other, the longer they will the good of each other, the more they behold the face of one another and the mannerisms of one another. And in a Inadvertently, over the years, they start copying each other's facial expressions. They start copying each other's mannerisms. And so this joke about them looking like each other really becomes they live like each other. Because what love does in willing the good of the other is I'm always looking to the other to see what's good for them, that I may will that for them. And in doing so, I'm becoming more and more like that person. Love makes us one in a very real sense because the more I become like that person, the more that person becomes like me, the more we become truly one. And that's why God must be present in marriage. Marriages that don't have God at the center run the risk of running into the rocks for this one reason. The couple needs to find something to love that's greater than themselves. My bride loves Jesus infinitely more than she loves me, and I thank God for it. I love my bride infinitely, I love Jesus infinitely more than I love my bride, and I thank God for that. Because every day I want to love Jesus more and more that I may become like him. My bride wants to love Jesus more that she may become like him. And every single day as we love each other, we want to become more like Christ to each other. So there is this infinite, eternal, immaterial, glorious goal that we are that we're striving for. That's what love is. When Jesus is taken out of the equation, when God is taken out of the equation, all the couple has is each other. And very soon they come to realize that all they have are each other's flaws. And believe me, one of the things that becomes very clear with the covenantal sacramental union is how flawed the other person is. One of the other things that actually becomes very clear that we don't like to admit is how flawed we are. And I'll just share this with you. I, I have my flaws. I truly do. And my bride is the first person to lovingly point them out to me every single time. And I do well when I listen to her point out my flaws. I do poorly when I tell myself, uh, I'll get a second opinion on that. And then I talk to my closest friends and they tell me the exact same thing my bride told me. That's the entire purpose of marriage, that because she truly wills my good in the love of Christ, she wants to reflect to me the glorious love of God, which includes the relinquishing of my flaws for the sake of my own salvation. That's why this fourth week of Advent is about love. With Jesus coming into the world as man, he has now shown us that love has a face. 
And he's also shown us how to love. Because Mary's yes, as we see in the readings, becomes this expression of what you and I ought to do with Christ every single day. Love is not the result of an affection. And that's why, and I need to make this very clear, we don't fall in love and fall out of love. That, that expression has its place, to be sure. But we don't fall in love and fall out of love and therefore need to leave the other person. I'm sorry, but that's irresponsible and childish. When I have committed to my bride, my will, my intellect, my heart, what I've effectively told her is everything I have is hers in Christ. She has effectively told me that everything she has is mine in Christ. Therefore, every day I make an act of the will to love her deeper, and my affections follow suit. So when you talk to couples who have quote-unquote fallen out of love, what you're really seeing is that it began earlier on with not putting the needs and the good of the other first. They stopped willing the good of the other, and the affections followed suit. What you and I love, our feelings will follow, and we will become. So, Let's talk about the readings then. The first reading is going to be taken from 2 Samuel 7. And it talks about King David wanting to build for God a house. This is the establishment of the Davidic covenant. It's one of the most important chapters in all of sacred scripture. And God tells David something that's really bizarre because David says, I want to build for the Lord a temple, a quote-unquote house, right? And this is what God says. Should you build me a house to dwell in? Uh Uh-uh. You want to build me a house? I will build you a house. I will make you famous. And David immediately sees what's going on here. I will establish a house for you. When your time comes, you will rest with your ancestors. But I'll raise up your heir, not heirs, heir. I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm and strong. I will be a father to him. He shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall stand firm forever. David's response to this is bonkers. David goes absolutely ballistic in his response. It's overkill until you realize what David is realizing. God has effectively said that there's going to be a kind of divine son of David who will sit on a divine, eternal Davidic throne. That person will be a fleshly descendant of David. It took years for Israel to come to this conclusion. And to this day, you and I have an obligation to keep preaching this gospel, even to the Israelites that are not converted. But the Israelites are coming, the Israelites are coming to this realization that Jesus Christ is truly the Messiah. So when we look at this text, what we see is David came to this realization first. So this Hebrew word, bayith, I will build you a house, it doesn't just mean house in a physical sense. A bayith, the Hebrew bayith, it means a dynasty. I'm building for you, in you, David, an eternal kingdom. The Messiah shall be an eternal son of God. And this is why when we look at the responsorial psalm, David's response to God is encapsulated in Psalm 89. Forever I will sing of the goodness of the Lord. Why? Because God said, I've made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to David my servant. Forever I will confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. David knows he doesn't deserve this. Anyone who reads the scriptures will know, while David is a man after God's own heart, David was also a man after certain things that were not godly. This promise was made to David because David had a commitment to God to elevate God above even his own sinfulness. So that by the time you and I come to the second reading of the Sunday, taken from Romans 16, Paul is telling us, well, understand this, brothers and sisters, to him who can strengthen you according to the gospel and proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret for long ages, now manifested through prophetic writings, according to the command of the eternal God, made known to all nations to bring about what? The obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever and ever. Paul is saying in no uncertain terms here, the eternal kingdom that the world was waiting for has now been established through the one and only Son of God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as established through his one holy Catholic and apostolic church. This is a doxology, a blessing that Paul is giving, not just to the Romans, but to the nations. So that when you and I come to Luke 138, we see the Annunciation narrative. 
Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. This complete act of surrender. Behold the handmaid. With all modesty, Mary makes that declaration. I mean, look at this. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, Hail, full of grace. We don't have time in this episode to talk about it. And Mary just surrenders. I am the handmaid of the Lord. That word for the Almighty will overshadow you, episkiatso, episkiatse, will be the same word in the Septuagint for the glory cloud of the Lord overshadowing the temple. There's a Trinitarian allusion here. Now, why am I saying all of this to you? The angels and Mary mirror selfless love of God. So my challenge to you and to your families this week is number one, firstly, as a family, let's sit down and talk about how can we show love to each other in a greater way this week. Choose one act that we can do for every family member. This can be spending quality time, maybe an extra hug every day to each person or a little gift that I can give to each person that shows I put thought into loving the person. Or if you're like me, you like receiving books. So giving your daddy or your husband extra books this week just to express your deep love for him. Hint, hint. I, 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 my darling bride is watching this episode, so I'm directly speaking to her. So talk with your family. Let everyone commit to showing an act of love to each member of the family this week and make a personal act of prayer every single day. Holy Spirit, show me and grant me the grace to give you a fuller, deeper yes every day of this week. Until next time, until Christmas Day, God bless you and keep you always. I'm Marcus Peter.